great honor to be here, great pleasure and great comfort to be here. It's really a case of the consolation of philosophy and I really want to thank the International School of Philosophy for doing the honor of giving me this plenary because I think if I weren't here I would be home with my favorite collection of gin bottles getting absolutely <laughs> sloshed <laughs> to celebrate the inauguration of the 45th um, President of the United States. He's been in power for 23 minutes and we're still alive so maybe we're going to pull through. Um, that's, that's all. We will discuss more the details of this um, concentration of uh, misogyny, racism, climate change denials and white lash uh, in the seminars tomorrow. But I can add an extra layer of this in response, I think, to the opening that we just had. The news feed came this morning that the Trump administration is shutting down the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Research Council. And there is an international appeal now to sign up to particularly the NEH, which has been of the greatest importance to fund um, all of our projects. This came this morning. It's our present for the... Um, inauguration. So it's a great comfort to be here, a great consolation. I'm just delighted to see so many highly intelligent um, young faces uh, being in love with a discipline that I, has dominated um, my entire existence. If you are into philosophy in some way, you're a very sick person. You'll never get rid of this. It's, it's a virus. Um, and whatever you do with this, um, and most of the philosophy will not be done in philosophy departments, it will be done in the world, whatever you do with it, it's, you will keep going back to it. It's, it's like an attachment to an archive that will never ever stop. It's the most amazing archive of texts um, that you can imagine. Um, uh, and one of the great delights in having had uh, radical teachers, having had the chance to, to uh, go to the lectures of Foucault, to, go to the seminar of Deleuze to work with that generation is that they made us discover texts that we actually had never encountered in a normal curriculum of philosophy. And so my, the traces of my belonging to that generation of French, continental, Sorbonne trained philosophers is that there is much more to philosophy than what you get in a university curriculum. So keep on reading and keep on exploring. There is more to philosophy than you will be able to meet even at the best universities um, uh, in the world. Philosophy as part of the world, philosophy in the world, philosophy as our way of relating to the world. Um, thinking with your feet, thinking in the streets, thinking while holding hands in the streets. And how fantastic that tomorrow as we're here fighting with you for the Olympics and while the world becomes much more nationalistic and closed off, here we are trying to keep the boundaries open as everything shuts down, that there will be demonstrations across the world. And I think the fact that we are expecting half a million people in Washington tomorrow, that people will be demonstrating in Amsterdam while we are here, that there is 35 cities in the UK demonstrating, makes me think that you may have the opportunity to actually see the 1970s returning. And you don't have to just talk to your parents about it, you can just go and have a look at what happens when people actually take back the world. My teachers taught me that philosophy belongs in and to the world, and that our responsibility is to think of and being accountable for the present. Now, the present, is not exactly what we teach when we teach philosophy or when we teach any of the humanities. The humanities are very much tied to their past, to their history. And, and I think you probably have already had a taste of this, that studying the great texts is in a sense taking a time-traveling exercise back to the past. And it, it's necessary, it's important, it's crucial that we see the developments of the great traditions. But thinking has to be of here and now. Thinking has to be of and in the present. And this tension between a discipline becoming its own history and being married only to its own history, philosophy becoming the history of philosophy, and being locked in a dialogue with itself, the tension between that and an opening up of your thinking abilities in the mode of relating to the present, to the real world. The tension between the two is going to construct your existence, your mental life, and your careers, I hope for you. Um, and it is a tension that can only be creative. It does not need to be resolved. It just needs to be managed, self-styled, 
and made operational so that you can make thinking the fuel of your personal development, of your social commitment, of your sense of citizenship, and of your sense to belonging to a common world. It's going to be tough in the world that we are living in, with barriers going up all over the place. But what a better message for a philosophy Olympia than to say, hey, guess what? We are the world. <laughs> Down with the walls, Pink Floyd, band of my times. <laughs> uh, do not construct more uh, borders, construct more bridges. We actually need to be able to think freely across the board. The present. The present is not just a flat entity. It's not just a fleeting moment. Gilles Deleuze and Philippe Guattari in What is Philosophy teach us that the present is both the record of what we are ceasing to be, the record of what we are ceasing, stopping to be, and the seeds of what we're in the, prom in the process of becoming. It is both traces of the past and insights into the future in a continuum. And Deleuze, Deleuze has a very kind of monistic, uh, con sort of continuous theory of time. He does his philosophy of time with Bergson uh, and continuity between past, present, and future in a constant process of becoming. The present is both the record of what we're ceasing to be and the trace of what we're in the process of becoming. Simultaneously, actual and virtual, looking in multiple directions and at the same time. To be of and in the present, you have to have multiple forms of literacy. You need to know enough about the past to know that we are, guess what? in a post-truth world, whatever that means. For a philosopher to be in a post-truth world, that's a crisis. We need a second bottle of gin, just <laughs> to survive, or a third, I don't know, we've lost count already, uh, to survive the absolute indignity of imagining that we could be in a post-truth world. But to understand how we got to this already requires um, some sense of the past, the record of what we're seizing to be and the sense of indignation at the fact the truth does not seem to matter, um, that, that we have actually politicians telling us the truth doesn't matter, the indignation that we should feel about that, pointing to directions in the future of what we want to become. You can see the traces of Michel Foucault, the education that I received, the training that I received, the training that irritates anybody that is from the German tradition where philosophy is defined in very different terms if you have followed the never-ending debate between German critical theory, mostly Habermas, and the French, the famous Habermas-Foucault debate. Two very different definitions um, of how philosophy works, but both of them equally committed to some sense of the public sphere, to some sense of the common world that we inhabit. And so as a generation that comes after all of that, and you should be feel, feeling free to cut and paste, to mix and match from whatever tradition uh, you want without feeling any sense of displaced loyalty, so long as you do place the activity of thinking firmly in the world. And this has been the reason why from very early on I was very fortunate in having formidable teachers already at the ANU in Canberra. Um, I was trained by Genevieve Lloyd as an undergraduate. Genevieve Lloyd, 1984, The Men of Reason, is one of the first great texts of feminist philosophy. She's also one of the great Spinoza scholars. Genevieve Lloyd has two mad major studies of Spinoza. And, uh, and she continues to write phenomenal stuff on the Enlightenment, as she has trained people like Moira Gatins, and who is one of the great young Spinozists of today. So I get my Spinoza, the great Dutch Jewish philosopher, in, in, in Canberra from an Oxford trained incredible woman whom I saw just three weeks ago, I was in Sydney, she's almost 80, and we walked on Bondi Beach and spoke about Spinoza and technology. Bless her soul, I was fortunate. I had my feminism brought to me by major minds. And going to Paris because I wanted to follow the lectures of Foucault, I dropped on my knees when I actually met a person that I thought wasn't even human. 
Simone de Beauvoir is for me the closest I got to touch immortality. <laughs> I've met many other people before, nobody has ever had the impact upon me. This is the genius um, uh, that I met, extraordinary. I worked for many years with the rigore and the people that were the closest to us in that generation of feminists. I watched the rise of what you could call feminist philosophy, and my great colleagues of today, from Judith Butler to Liz Gross, Donna Haraway, Henrietta Moore, are people who do philosophy with that sense of commitment to social justice. So feminism it was part of the air that I breathed. It was part of my oxygen. And, and I've done my very best to bring that tradition, both of great figures of women in the history of philosophy and of feminist concepts, and, into the mainstream um, of my uh, training. Um, it was hard work because with all due respect and with all great love for this discipline, this is a male-dominated fortress. Um, and the position of women in philosophy from Jenny Lloyd, who was treated like dirt when she became the president of the Australasian Philosophy Association, to the dismal statistics about jobs for women in philosophies, you have to be prepared for the fight of your life if you're going to go for a career in academic philosophy. And having said that, go girls go is the next <laughs> statement. <laughs> but look at your statistics and again demand accountability. How can a discipline remain so male dominated here and now in this time and age? What has gone wrong here? Uh, is there a model of the thinker, a model of what the philosopher is, that makes that philosopher intrinsically masculine and white and European and German speaking, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, do we have here what Deleuze calls an image of thought? And the image of thought gives you the image of a thinker, of what the thinker should be. Here we go, the notion of the imaginary, the notion of the image representation. Um, can we imagine a philosopher as ooh, a Muslim wise person? Do we even know that Islam is a massive philosophical tradition? I don't think Wilder knows. Somebody should break the news. <laughs> Maybe he will change a haircut if he hears the news that there is Muslim philosophy. May change his life. Um, uh, can the figure of the philosopher be a black woman? Ooh, can't imagine that. Um, unimaginable. Representation images, expectations that come with what Gilles Deleuze called an image of thought. Feminist philosophy has engaged with that image of thought, saying we actually need to question the premises that we bring to a discipline that has been immensely diversified and where women have actually played quite a role as authors of texts. For me, feminism was a way of actually holding, is a way of holding my discipline to accountability and saying, well then, what mechanisms of inclusion <coughs> and exclusion create something that we could call philosophy, the discipline? Um, uh, is there, in the many sports that we compete in and the philosophical Olympiad, do we have a strong tradition of feminist philosophical texts? Do we read those texts? Um, do we read the black liberationist texts? Do we need Fanon? Uh, do, do we read a Messier? Do we need to say, L'ouverture, do we need the, the other voices of the philosophical tradition, or are we self replicating a certain image of thought? This is, I think, the, 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 the call for diversity, the call for openness, which is what feminist philosophy can do for us, and of course, many, many um, uh, sort of thinkers, like, like particularly Deleuze, are very, very useful in trying to diversify the image that we make ourselves of what counts as a great philosopher. It really does not have to be like the image of God in the Sistine Chapel. It does not have to be old white men with a long beard touching the fingers of a gorgeous, drop that gorgeous white boy who is going to be the next master thinker. It does not have to be an exact replica of patriarchy. Philosophy can be absolutely open, diversified, looking like the world that it is trying to think in. 
this is my tradition, this is why I never got a job in philosophy, but like many of my generation, we went out and created new interdisciplinary areas of thought. I was 32 when I got the professorship in an, in an area that nobody had any idea of what it was and what could possibly women's studies mean. And we knew exactly what we wanted to do with it. And just look at the, the size and the scale of what is now the gender studies program of Utrecht. And I left it in 2005 because I wanted a younger generation to take over. We have 300 students in the first year. How many does philosophy have? I want to know this one. <laughs> Agenda point for our discussion here is where is the venue where philosophy happens? And does philosophy have to happen in classrooms? Does it have to happen in the university? Where is the home of philosophy? Well, the answer is loud and clear. The world. <laughs> Everywhere. Thinking is critique. Thinking is creativity. Thinking is happening everywhere. And, uh, and if you look at the construction of our cognitive capital today, in the present stage of our economic development, they call it advanced capitalism, in spite of its very backward aspects and, and its archaic aspect, but advanced capitalism is a very advanced cognitive system. And, uh, it is a research-driven economic system that we're in. And, and cognitive capitalism needs people with ideas, and people with the right and the ability to break the rules. Critique and creativity, and these are the two pillars that build what I call the affirmative character of philosophical thinking. And when Flores invited me for this, I thought affirmation was the idea that I wanted to uh, actually focus you on between critique and creativity, defining the task of philosophy as developing relations and modes of affirmation in opposition to the negativity of the time. Now, another word for affirmation is joy. And joy, before we all go hippie and start going new ages and pass the joint or whatever your generation does, comes from, comes from radical Spinozism, comes from the rereading of Spinoza that the generation of my teachers started back after 1968. 1968 was the last big political revolution of the baby boomers. And, and like all political revolutions, it's both exciting and a total failure. Uh, it, it brought Charles de Gaulle to power, but it changed the world at the same time. I was too young, I wasn't part of it. Uh, but after that moment, uh, the generation that was Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze, Irigaray, realized that a Hegelian Marxist definition of critical thinking based on dialectical oppositions, that dualistic way of thinking actually was not helpful. It was not helpful to define the conditions of our own existence in advanced capitalism. The generation of the French, that generation of French, understands the character of advanced capitalism very quickly. There is really a French moment of analysis that is quite historically unique. Think of the first, one of the first analysis of the media society for a society of spectacle of Guy Debord. And Guy Debord is terribly important for my pussy riots. And, and thank you for mentioning them. They are, they are situationists. Guy Debord, the first analysis of media culture. When was that book published? In what year do we get Guy Debord saying, our culture is mutating. We are not a production culture. We are reproduction culture. We're a media culture. Society of a Spectacle, you can Google it. What are we looking at? 1962-63. Roland Barthes, first analysis of media culture in a phenomenal collection of essays called Mythologies, where he analyzes magazines. He analyzes pictures and says, you know, we have a media issue here, 1957. So there is a moment, well, this is miles before anybody was thinking of media. The, the, the Gilles Deleuze writes with Guattari, 
anti-Oedipus, which is a critique of capitalism in 1972. An anti-Oedipus critique of capitalism 1972 in the first, um, in, in chapter three, has a prediction of where capitalism is going to go. And it's the famous chapter in, where, in which they talk about the financialization of the economy, in which they say, we will not produce anything anymore except credit. Another word for credit is debt. We will all be heavily indebted, and money will be made speculating on our debts. The end of industrial society, the coming of a post-industrial society, financialization of the economy, the coming of debt, 1972. The official left wing of the time, socialist and communist parties, go absolutely hysterical and think that these people are mad. And you get the official left blocking this reading of where we are going with the coming of a media society, saying this is science fiction, we can't do anything with this, let's go on with the socialist revolution. And this going on with the socialist revolution is a dialectical way of thinking. <clears throat> it is thesis, antithesis, synthesis. It is us and them. It is media, culture. It is nature, culture. It is self and others. It's a dualistic mode of thinking. Critical Spinozism comes in as the antidote. And in, from the, the early 1970s, around the Ecole Normale Supérieure, which was the temple of philosophical thinking, around people like Althusser, and, and uh, young Lacan, um, people start reading Spinoza. And Gilles Deleuze is one of the people that says, forget Hegel, let's do some serious Spinoza here. Let's look at monistic system. Let's look at the hypothesis that there is one matter and that we are all variations within that matter. We are modulations <coughs> within a matter that is the same. We are such stuff as upper primates are made of, but we're also such stuff as dreams and stars are made of, the unity of matter. Now, this irritates the Hegelians. Hegel hated this stuff. He thought it was pulp, because what we need is distinctions, and distinctions have to be categorical, and categorical distinctions give us a cutting off point, and with the cutting off point, we get transcendent values, and with transcendent values, we get older that we can all march off and invade Poland. <laughs> <laughs> this notion of a line of immanence, Spinoza, Nietzsche, Foucault, Deleuze, and a line of transcendence with essentially Kant and derivatives and that goes into Derrida, into parts of Lacan, into Levinas. Um, line of immanence, line of transcendence. Again, binaries, not very useful, but they help you organize the thinking. Neo-Spinozism is the line of immanence. Um, Spinoza is the greatest contribution of Dutch Jewish philosophy to the world. He's also a forgotten figure, a marginal figure. We have an incredible scholars of, of Spinoza, certainly in Utrecht, an amazing school of Spinoza scholars, but very philological and again, very historically based. The idea that you take Spinoza, you add a bit of 20th century, a bit of Nietzsche, shake it, serve it, chill, and you bring it into the 21st century. The operation of transporting, I think Deleuze would call it rhizomic nomadic transposition, as my language. <laughs> nomadic transposition is disrespectful of philosophy as a history of philosophy. The idea that you can cut and paste, I take monism from Spinoza, I take temporal continuum from Bergson. I think from Nietzsche, the absolute critique of humanism. I mix it with my concern for media culture and cognitive capitalism. I get a philosophy for the 21st millennium. That's the operation of Foucault and Deleuze. And classical philosophy goes berserk. I say, you can't do this. I say, why can't I do this? <laughs> why can't I bring philosophy to bear? into the world of today. What philosophers need to do for us is allow us to ask the questions that we need to ask of the world of today. Questions that always have to do with truth and power. Why are all philosophers white? Why are we all in this delusion of oneness and sameness? What is the status of difference? 
Why is being different from the same thing as being less than? Can't I just be different and not be less than? Can we liberate difference from a hierarchy of values? Can we disengage it from a dialectics? Can we make it positive different? I am other, not less, not more other. The positivity of difference is one of the issues that Deleuze picks from Spinoza. And the other one is the ethics of joy affirmation. Now, joy and affirmation need to be approached in a non-psychological manner. At this point, we need a barrel of gene. The idea that we take affirmation and joy and we don't make them into psychological states. Oh God, how do we do that? We do it by holding the frame very still and asking ourselves why is it so difficult to de-psychologize affects? Why is it that if I think of joy or affirmation, I think about feeling good? And I think that is absolutely not the way in which Spinoza means joy and affirmation. <laughs> and he means joy and affirmation as geometrical sets of rel relation. Joy or affirmation is the mode of relation that increases your ability to relate to the world. That you can take in more of the world, more difference, more challenges, more. It's, it's a mythology, it's, it's a question of energy and forces. The opposite of joy, which is sadness, is whatever shuts you down. It makes you actually scared of taking in more, um, afraid and suspicious of difference. Does this sound slightly familiar? Fear of otherness. Um, otherness is threatening. Um, otherness is not me. Otherness is something that I need to be scared of. Opening out ethics of joy, shutting down negativity. And one of the definition of our seminar on fascism, we are defining the, uh, fascism as the negativity of the soul. When so much negativity goes into you that you really feel that nothing is possible. Just sit down, wait for the Holocaust, drink a lot of gin, make it good. I, su I suggest the botanist, it's the best of them all. Uh, the problem with de-psychologizing the discussion is the problem of individualism. And I think the, the crucial issue with Spinoza's philosophy is going beyond the self. I'll make sure that this is the last big point I give you because it's a lot just for a handful. Spinoza reread with the generation of the French philosopher is attacking liberal individualism. Is attacking me, myself, and I as our vision of uh, ourselves. Now, I am one of two people in the world that does not even have a Facebook page. Um, you probably have 36 and you spend your life in them. <laughs> so to say to you that me, myself, and I is not actually a very relevant point of reference. And to say that like, no like is of no interest whatsoever to philosophical discussion is bordering on the impolite. So accept my apologies, but bear with me. The philosophy tradition that I come from despises identity. And we get this contempt of identity from a combination of Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx, the three horsemen of the apocalypse of modernity. Identity is a grammatical fiction. Identity is a, is a statistical necessity that basically gets you going where advanced capitalism wants you to go, shopping. <laughs> Identity is what you spend your life looking for, confirming, and spending a fortune to make sure that whatever you eat, wear, haircut that you do, the music and the sex that you consume confirms this thing called identity. So from the beginning, Freud um, and, and the applications of Freud through psychoanalysis, going into Foucault, my teacher became famous with a book that predicated the death of man. Man is finished. The individual is over. Get a life. <laughs> Good one. Get a life. The radical imminence of a life that is far more than the individual. This is where Spinoza comes in. Open up. 
if we are such stuff as upper primates are made of and stars are made of, if we are part of one matter modulated into differential configurations, we need to be able to relate and cut across. Identity is a shutting down. It's a paranoid construction that makes us fear otherness. Become post-identitarian, go nomadic, take a walk. And I think that opening up becomes a whole discussion on individualism, especially possessive individualism, versus a more extended understanding of the self. In the 1970s, this was just irritating for the communists and the Marxists that were there with their dialectics of history, irritating for the liberals because they believe in the individual as the essential fiscal entity that will keep the system going. Um, and, and it became just a philosophical issue until the beginning of the biogenetic era. Mm -hmm. With the human genome program and the coming of the new neurosciences to say to my colleagues in the life sciences in the out of, of Utrecht, to say, you know, we are all made of the same matter, they say, oh, where have you been for the last 30 years? Under a rock? Tell me something new. Contemporary science is monistic. From biogenetics to the new neurosciences, there's no need to tell our scientific community that we're all made of the same matter. In fact, they are criticizing the humanities, see the shutdowns of humanities institutions, because we still believe in the centrality of the individual. We are still in a Copernican worldview as the world moves into extended cognitions, computational networks, assemblages of human and non-human thinking agents. And we're still there with cogito ergo sum. Hello, wakey, wakey. <laughs> so you can enter this debate through the contemporary sciences and say, well, neurally, we're all interconnected. Biogenetically, we're talking about gene editing these days. We can remake configurations of life. So is it not useful to bring in a philosophy of immanence, of monism, that allows us to think about the interconnections between us and others where difference is positive, modulations of the same matter. And if we make this switch, bringing in critical Spinozism, attached to it an ethics where the ethical good is increasing our ability to relate, open up, as opposed to shutting down. And I think with open up, shutting down, we can bring in every single variable of inclusion and exclusions, um, from nationalism to demented xenophobia to anthropocentrism in the era of the Anthropocene, denying what we are doing to the climate is one of the greatest crimes that we could be doing, and um, we will pay the price for that. The idea that I would like to stimulate, to explore as the platform to navigate through the difficulties, the challenges that you're going to be confronted with, um, uh, as a result of the enormous geopolitical changes that we are undergoing. Uh, if you read my book, The Posthuma, which I hope you do, it's a lovely booklet. Uh, <laughs> don't discount anyone. <laughs> uh, I quote my favorite sentence in the English language, um, uh, and it comes from uh, uh, George Eliot in uh, a novel that I adore called Middlemarch. Um, I don't know if you know any of this great British novel. Middlemarch was, according to Virginia Woolf, the only novel written for adults. Um, an incredible novel, 400 pages, quite heavy going. But the sentence is, if we were open and alert, we would hear, we would be able to hear the roar that lies on the other side of silence and to hear the beating of the squirrel's heart. If we were open, we could hear the roar that lies on the other side of silence and the beating of the squirrels are. As things stand, we walk around wrapped in stupidity. George Eliot, Mary Ann Evans, it's, 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 she's a woman writing as a man in the 19th century, and she is the British translator of Spinoza, she's the great Spinozist. So if you read Middlemarch or The Mill on the Floss, you're actually getting an introduction 
to Spinoza without knowing that you are. The roar, spectacular, the beating of the squirrel's heart, imperceptible. Connections, to be interconnected, to feel that unity while being able to make the differences, to make the differences not categorical, punitive modes of discrimination, but useful interfaces, bridges across the singularity of each of our compositions, to be able to cultivate an ethics where opening up is what we try to do as a community, experimenting together with what we are capable of becoming, come hell or high water, which in the world of today may well be our fate. What better program for a 21st century philosophy than this, affirmatively together in the path to multiple differences, taking our responsibilities, overcoming individualism to become capable of more interconnectedness, of more interrelation. I think philosophy in this mode could definitely uh, save our lives and give us a better sense of what living a life could be ethically and meaningful for us. That's it. <laughs>